As we've mentioned, students have been online only this semester, but several did come in to take the ACT and the PSAT over the last few weeks. And we were able to successfully offer socially distanced activities for those that came in the night before. Some of those options included lectures that our faculty volunteered to teach in our recital hall. The fact that so many of our faculty and students chose to be part of these shows demonstrates how important and how much everyone loves being in the classroom environment here and how much we miss those interactions between the faculty and the students that you just don't get from a virtual experience. So first, we're going to introduce Dr. Jason Anderson, who's offering a mini lesson on the Emperor of All Maladies, taken from a lecture given to his modern genetic students each year. So, thank you to Mr. Sumner back there for inviting me to do this because I guess I feel like I'm back in the classroom. And this is as close as I'm gonna get for right now. So hopefully, hopefully, knock on, we'll, we'll be back in the spring. So what I want to introduce to you all, some of you have a science background, some of you um, do not, but there's a topic that will touch us all. Um, unfortunately, in our lives, I got introduced um, to this topic, I want to say, in 2007. And, you know, it's a phone call you'll never forget. You know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, your grandfather has a cute white boy in leukemia. What? Huh? I just talked to him earlier today. Yeah, it's 30 days ago. What? Wow. Okay. And then the next question, of course, I was in graduate school. And then my family as well, what is it? <laughs> uh, I don't know specifically, but I can kind of get you down the line. And that's how I kind of got introduced to cancer. And from there I became, you know, kind of the informal doctor of the family, let my family know about this. So what I want to do for you today is kind of give you, not to scare you, but to let you know that this exists and that it's really, at its root, it's simple. Cancer is a simple, a simply, I guess, simply explainable disease, but it's so complex. I know that's such a dichotomous way of explaining it, but it really is. So I want to kind of give you, I'm going to give you a scenario to kind of paint where I want to go with this. So imagine that you're a 16-year-old teenager, and of course, what, what, what do y'all have in front of you all? Y'all have, yeah, 23andMe, and y'all have all this information to know thyself, learn all about who you are, right? They, they give you all these different things. Right now, I don't even find out your your blood type. By the way, I'll be positive. I'm a niche. But you can find out all this information. Look, I mean, it's just VIP, Health and Ancestry Service. So all this information, right from there, Ancestry, learn all about yourself. That's great, fine, and then, until if you're a 16-year-old teenager, and you do 23 and me, and I mean, man, they can give you all types of information, and maybe, some information you don't want to know, but they give it to you anyway. So imagine you do this test and you find out, hey, I am a carrier, or even worse, I have two mutated BRCA1 genes. You're 16 years old and all you wanted to find out was your ancestor. But you find out you have two mutated BRCA1 genes. Well, all of a sudden, you have what's known as the burden of knowing. That's what you're about to carry with you for the rest of your life. So I want to play, to, uh, play you a short little video, kind of explaining this, and then we'll kind of move on from there.
So kind of put yourself in, in those shoes. I'm 20, I'm young, or I'm 15, I'm 16, and I get all this genetic information. What do you do with it? So this, is, this happens with all inherited diseases. There's a chance that you may find out something that you may want to know, you may not want to know. And today we're going to talk about, and this is the title of a book and a great document, it's called The Emperor of All Maladies. And that's what cancer is. You know, right now we live in this COVID world where COVID, 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 COVID dominates. But there's, there, there lies in a disease that kills 600,000 plus Americans every year and millions worldwide. One out of every two men, one out of every three women will get cancer. That's a reality. So it sounds more but it's the truth. So what does that mean? You will be affected by it somehow, some way, even directly or indirectly. So what I'm going to show you all is just kind of some proof how it happens and kind of give you hope because I, I tell this to every genetics class I teach, more of I include, y'all will figure this out. You will. My generation, we're running out of time. Y'all will figure it out because we're getting close. So first of all, I don't want to get into too much detail, but on its own merit, cancer itself is just unregulated cell growth. It's cell growth and cells that have abnormally divided and divided and divided. That's it. A normal cell went broke. It decided, you know what? I'm going to divide when I want to divide. And I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to keep going. That's all it is. That's, that's what cancer is. The issue is how do we get there? What's kind of, what are the causes? This is a little complex, but we have the basic cell cycle where we go through the different phases. We have G1, S, G2, and Alex, and M. So these are the phases in which the cell gets ready to divide, and then of course divides in mitosis or meiosis. There are genes that control the cell cycle. That's all I want you to understand. The cell cycle can't start or stop without some genes telling it to stop or stop. That's it. So we have these things called checkpoints. And these checkpoints are critical. Every time we reach a certain checkpoint, the cell decides, hey, everything looks good, divided, everything's growing properly, we can go to the next one. What cancer does, cancer interrupts these checkpoints at different places. And that's how we can get a cell getting cancer. That's a lot of reading. Okay, so what a cell can do to offset it? Well, a cell has a built-in um, program, a built-in gene that um, is called apoptosis. And basically, if the cell figures out, or the cell goes through some checks and like, wait, hold on. Something's wrong. I didn't grow properly. Something happened to uh, my genetic information in the sentences. Something occurred. It's called program cell death. The cell will kill itself. It sounds like I'm not going to divide. I will terminate myself. Well, the issue is it's a sneaky, sneaky cancer. Cancer will, once a cell becomes cancerous, it will disrupt and uh, disable the apoptotic genes. So it's almost as if the cancer cell or cancer is thinking, it's like, hold on. If there is a gene that can destroy me, let me go ahead and disable it now so that when I'm dividing, 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 there's nothing that can stop me. So our normal cells have apoptosis, cancer kind of disrupts that and gets rid of it. So, when we're talking about genes that can cause cancer, they fall into two categories. They're either what's known as oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. Anybody see something kind of? Oncogenes, what you hear in that word? Oncogenes. 
Oncology happens. So some of you may become oncologists. I don't know. Oncology is the study of cancer. So there are genes that are called oncogenes that normally when they work, they promote cell division. They're, they're, they're good. But when they're mutated, they can cause some issues. This is obvious, right? Sometimes science just will give an obvious hint. Tumor suppressor cancers. But obviously they're going to, um, they're involved in tumor suppressor, but they're also involved in other aspects of the cell. So these are two classes of genes that we have to focus on when you're trying to understand cancer. And we're going to make this relatively painless. Okay. This gene right here. RAS. RAS is a, all this other stuff is a little complex. RAS is a gene, it's an oncogene, and its job is to stimulate cell division. That's its job. Let me show you a pathway. So here we go. This looks like it's complex, it's really not. Here's our nucleus, where our genetic information is. Here is outside of the cell. Here is inside the cell, the cytoplasm. Well, there's going to be a signal from the outside that's going to tell the cell to divide. It's time for you to divide. Well, RAS activates it. So that signal gets sent. RAS says, okay, I become active now. Hey, I'm ready to do my job. It sends the signal inside the nucleus divide. The nucleus will divide. Signal is going to come back, tell RAS, hey, I'm done dividing, and it's going to go in reverse. RAS will inactivate. Cell is good. Cell is normal. So, RAS has an important function. That's what normal RAS does. Whoa. What happens when RAS is mutated? RAS gets the signal. RAS, all right, I'm active. RAS tells the cell, divide, divide, divide. The problem is, RAS doesn't stop. RAS keeps going. It keeps feeding that signal. Divide, keep dividing, keep dividing, keep dividing. One gene can all of a sudden promote extracellular growth which can then lead down the road to cancer. One gene. So when you start thinking about it, it seems cut and dry. Oh yeah, yeah, one gene can do this. Now, the issue with RAS is that RAS is what's known as a dominant activator. What does that mean? You only need one copy of RAS to potentially get cancer. So if you inherited a mutated RAS from either your mom or your dad, that's all it needs for it to begin the process of causing cancer. So it's, um, it's rare. It doesn't happen a lot in the germ line. So it's, it's not inherited all, most of the time. It can happen. But a lot of times, these mutations happen sporadically. Like when um, RAS is often mutated in um, melanomas. It, just, it happens over your lifetime. You really don't pass it on. It can, but it's rarely that you do pass it on. So this is an example of an oncogene that can cause cancer. Now, what about a tumor suppressor gene? What has to happen there? Well, with tumor suppressor genes, you have to get two mutations to get this. So you know these genes, I'm going to skip past this to go to the one that's relevant. You know the two genes as BRCA1 and BRCA2. That's some of the most popular tumor suppressor genes. So BRCA1 stands for breast cancer 1, Breast cancer too. So these genes are tumor suppressor genes that are often inherited and involved in um, 
breast and ovarian cancer. So generally what happened, you get one copy, you usually inherit one of them, and then over time, you develop something happens where you, the other gene may mutate on the other chromosome, and you get, um, you have the two mutations. Now, this is important for you all to know. Um, Angelina Jolie is a great example. Angelina Jolie tested, uh, she had, oof, I want to say maybe 15 years ago, in my opinion. She has a familiar history of breast and ovarian cancer in her family. And it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's really, it has ravaged her family. So she decided to get tested. She was, she found out that she carried both mutant copies of, um, what was it, was BRCA2. She had both of them. Did she have cancer? No. So when you, that's kind of the complex thing about it. When you find out you have two mutant variants of a, of a tumor suppressor chain, it doesn't mean you have cancer. It just means you have the genes that can promote cancer. Now, did she do like the young lady who you saw in the earlier video? She decided, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to have kids. I'm not going to let this stop. Well, what happened? She developed cancer a couple of years later. Angelina Jolie did something completely not unheard of, but at that time it was like, whoa. She decided to have a double mastectomy. And then she decided to have a hysterectomy. So she went ahead and said, all right, any tissue that's associated with this gene that can become cancerous, I'm going to remove it. You know, she had to she, she was mid life at that time. That's why, again, when all this genetic information is out there, you have to be wary of, do you want to know? If you are so young, what would you do if you find out, A, if you do have familiar history of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, you might want to know, right? That's something that you have to pay attention to. But once you find out, what do you do? Do I, you know, like right now, they'll tell you about pre the preventative measures, prophylactics. You remove the tissue in question. But at 16, do you, I mean, you don't think about a hysterectomy, my guy. You don't think about having a mastectomy. But what if it saves your life? Well, is it, can you develop can, um, breast cancer at 18 or 19? Yes, I have a second cousin that had stage 3 breast cancer, survived. But I thought it was like 19 and 20. So it doesn't have like an age limit. So these are things that you have to be aware of, especially if it's in your family. So these tumor suppressor genes, and they're on the list of, there are a lot of them. I skipped over them, but there are many, many different types of tumor suppressor genes. So we have these tumor suppressor genes that can cause cancer. And we have these oncogenes that can cause cancer. Well, why are there a list of, and you kind of see here, there's, there's a list of about 15 or so genes that are probably talked about. Because a lot of these genes, these genes here, and the, the gene we talked about before, RAS, they're commonly found in many different cancers. So it's not like, wait, hold on. If I have a mutated RAS, mutated RAS is going to give me X cancer. No, no. What generally happens is you get a mutated oncogene. And then when they start scanning, they start realizing, oh no, you have a mutated P53, and a mutated BRCA, and a mutated RNA. All of a sudden, you start to realize you have a cascading effect. You have multiple genes that have been mutated, and then that can lead to cancer. So when you put all of this kind of in, in perspective, and I kind of want to skip to this because I, I want you to, to really take this in.
And there are multiple pathways. So here's colorectal cancer, here's prostate cancer. So two different cancers. And you see how, see this like linear path. Well, this linear path, it looks linear, but it's not. And you see in this case, you see multiple genes over time that have been inactivated, a mutate, a tumor suppressive gene here, a dominant gene here, another tumor suppressor here, another one, another one. So what happens when you have cancer? This oncogene is pretty much synonymous with a gas pedal. So if you're, at, you're driving a car and you hit the gas, or well you go, right? This RAS gene controls cell division. Hit the gas pedal, cell divides. Well, y'all don't have to worry about this in life. A long time ago, Dr. Langford kind of remembers this. Um, you, the gas pedal doesn't get stuck in cars. <laughs> Your gas pedal could get stuck. You could be driving all of a sudden, you're like, Make all the things on the floor, and all of a sudden you're speeding up. Well, when this gene is mutated, it's like a stuck gas pedal. You can't stop. You can't stop dividing. The tumor suppressor gene is the brakes of the cell. Tumor suppressor. So when this one is okay, you're dividing. You're dividing. This one's like stop dividing. Slow down. But again, y'all don't have to worry about this. But what if someone cut the brake lines of your car? They can't stop. Can't stop. So what happens? You speed up anything. One is a gas pedal, one's your brakes. Both needs to speed up. Both of them will lead to unproliferated cell division. So when you look at all of this, the stage from having normal, you know, normal tissue all the way to one of the worst cancers, met um, metastatic colorectal cancer, you see what has to happen along the way. It's not just one gene, all right? There, there are five to ten to twenty, and when you see this prostate cancer, which is the deadliest cancer among um, men. You see, it's multiple genes, multiple, multiple, multiple genes that are inactivated. So, cancer, and what's so bad about it, every cancer is unique. Two people can have metastatic breast cancer and can have completely multiple sets of genes that are mutated, that are not the same. No one cancer is same. So when you start thinking about that, now you may start to think, wow, oh, that's maybe why there's not a general cure for cancer because no one cancer is the same. And kind of to put it into perspective, I know you can't see this. I just wanted to throw this out there. For you all in engineering who loves engineering, what does this look like? A circuit. This looks like a circuit. A very complex circuit. You know what this is? This, these are just pathways to cancer. This is just one. These are multiple pathways with a couple genes. You see those genes in the center? They kind of branch off. Those are the rasses. Those are the broncos. Those are the ones that control other genes. This is how we have to attack cancer. There are multiple pathways there, and everyone has their own unique pathway. Every cancer is unique to an individual. So how do we beat this? Right now, some of the biggest, is, is biggest therapies or the most important therapies are targeted gene therapy. And those gene therapies are focusing on your immune system. Teaching your own immune system to recognize, wait, something in the body is going wrong, and for it to attack. It's called immunotherapy. The future of cancer therapy is bright. 
the days of chemotherapy, everyone get the same chemotherapy. It's over. Because that doesn't work. But hey, if I can figure out if uh, Dr. Langford and myself, we both go in with uh, early stage uh, pancreatic cancer, not COVID, like that, never. And they said, well, Dr. Langford, we will treat you with this radio analog, and we'll treat you this way, this way, this way, based upon your cancer. And Dr. J, we'll treat you this way. And we're going to use your own immune systems to try to help recognize um, the cancer that you have. So what studies are showing us is that our immune system, when cancer strikes, a lot of times our immune systems don't recognize it as being foreign. So if we can teach our own immune system to recognize the cancer itself without harming the normal cells, then we have a better outlook on things. So kind of in, in summary, what I want you to take away from this is cancer is complex and it's simple. It's very simple in the way uh, it forms. It's complex in its underlying tail. As you kind of peel back the onion, you start realizing, oh, there's something else. You peel it back again, there's something else. But detection will be the key. For you all who, um, you know, I, I talked about the burden of knowing, but if you understand, if you have a familiar history of cancer in your family, you might want to start early with detection. Because even though it sounds barbaric, we can do something about breast cancer, right? There are insurance companies that if there's a familiar history of breast cancer in your family, they will pay for all of the testing. They will pay for treatment. Because they know if you take care of this now and then are not wait 10, 15, 20 years, then it's gonna be more costly. So early detection is the key. And from there, just pay attention. I mean, cancer has no age range. It has no ethnicity preference. It, it doesn't care. It does not care. It's, it's the emperor of all maladies for a reason. It, um, it's been here since the dawn of time, and there is actually some evidence. You look at some hieroglyphics, you like they were drawing about cancer. It's been here. So we can do something about it. Your generation can do something about it, but you can't stop. Y'all can't stop. Um, if you've been afflicted by it, you know what it can do. It's, I mean, it, it, it ravages families. Um, it can tear families apart. So I, I just encourage you all to, again, stay, um, don't let it, you know, dominate your life. Don't let it, um, act like, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. We can fight. And if you notice any, you know, you know, we're coming up, you know, we're in breast cancer awareness, but if you notice any um, support videos, or if you see any of them, they always will say, fight, fight, fight. Cancer, when you're battling cancer, it's a fight. And, and it's, it's, it's ironic, they gave my grandfather 30 days to live, and he actually lived 30 days, and never lost a hand at all. So, um, hopefully you um, learn a little bit about this. If you have any questions, I kind of finished with about 20 some minutes. If you have any questions, please let me know. That's the problem. That's the problem. We don't. We have no idea why a child is born with retinoblastoma. Well, I mean, there are cancer causing agents, right? So we know tobacco smoking and smoking cigarettes cause cancer. We know UV exposure causes cancer. We know exposure to this poison or that poison can cause cancer, right? The big thing right now, what the big round of loss, right? Huge. 
But outside of that, Sarah is like, we don't, I could go to, I could go in and get checked up tomorrow. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, stage one prostate cancer. Like, oh, I feel fine. Don't know. That's our issue. So if we can predict it, that's why they have screenings. That's why when you get a certain age, there are screenings for this. You get a certain age, they get recommend you have a mastectomy. Uh, a uh, mammogram every year, we suggest you do this. You have a prostate um, exam, have a PSA exam when you hit 40, when you hit 45. They're just benchmarks. We know that cancers are more prevalent as you get older. You start getting around 50, 55, you start to see the prevalence of cancer go up, but we don't know, sir. It, it, it's, it's sporadic, random, inherited. It, it, it's strange. You can inherit cancer. You can, it can be caused from UV to chemicals. We don't know. We don't know. We, there have been identical twins who have the same genetic information. One gets cancer, one doesn't. That is no day by request. Yes. Um, do you know about, like, uh, you probably do, but the paradox of the nature of larger organisms being less prone to cancer than smaller organisms? Yeah, I just wanted to know if you knew anything about Yeah, that. I mean, but we've seen, I mean, there are plants that get tumors. <laughs> but, but why do you think that larger organisms are more cells. Than like us? More cells. I mean, you have more cells. The more cells you have, the more prone you are to cancer. No, they are less prone to cancer. What are you talking about? Like, well, it depends how much they divide. So, I mean, our cells are typically actively divide. And the only cells that are not divided are nerve cells, heart cells, and others. Everything else is they're actively actively divided. Now why? I mean there there are cases of you know feline cancer, there are cases of I don't hear too much about larger larger mammals in the case. I'm sure it happens. It's just the fact I don't know how widely studied it is versus um humans and the fact that we again our cells are so we got so many cells that are so actively divided more they're actively divided and we live longer in a lot of cases um the more you're prone to errors that's always the case mitosis things will go wrong the longer you live it's rare that you, you find someone 70 80 90 years old with nothing you know wrong so as the longer you live the longer you know, your cells are still dividing, they're going to make mistakes over time. And that's when you see it. So you see more cancer. So think about it. You know, outside of elephants and some other mammals, we live a long time. More of the cancers are more prevalent later in life. So if you have something that's, you may be a large animal, but they live 20, 30 years, yeah, they might not get cancer. Yeah, like elephants and blue whales are significantly less prone to cancer than us. Even and they live long, yeah, but then, uh, it's called it's called pedo. Yeah, because they don't they don't have a concrete answer for why. You know, they don't. I don't know. know. We need to steal something from them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they got something going on. Nature. Any other questions, comments, Josh? Are you gonna have a list of the things that you would like to talk about to see? Yeah, but I mean, it's, so the paradox of that is even, okay, why we're living longer, but we have more maladies out there. So I'll give you an example. So my grandparents both, they lived to the mid 80s. They ate hard, to me, they ate hard. In terms of they fried things in Greece, they did this, they did that. And I'm like, they had nothing wrong. My grandfather didn't have anything wrong with him until he got leukemia at 85. Right, right? I mean, he didn't have any other overgrowth, oh, right? Or so this or that. No. But so think about it now, even though it seems like we're eating better in terms of diets and stuff, we have many, many more issues that are more prevalent now than they were, say, you know, two, three, four generations ago. So I don't know. Yeah, that, that's weird, Josh, because of the fact we are living longer. 
we still have, you know, we, we have better signs as a on us on the moment, yet we have more things that we're living with. That's the issue. I mean, as soon as you get sick with anything, they're ready to put you on some medication for anything. So, you gotta look into that in the future. Lose. Just from studies, from lab studies. It's just been shown that the study about tobacco and cigarettes, that was a study done a long time ago, but they just saw the prevalence. Epidemiologists recognized the whoa, we hope all the people who smoke, the incidence of cancer did that, they kind of tied the thing together. It's just the chemicals. We just know that there are certain cancer causing chemicals in and rats and different things that cause it. So we know it's prevalent with us as well. It doesn't mean you're gonna get it though. That's the weird thing. I have, a, I have relatives that have smoked all their lives. They're in their seventies. They're fine. They have the smoker's voice, cough, everything. No cancer. I know people have died and never smoked a day in their life from no cancer. All right, y'all. Thank y'all for being my audience. Thank you, Mr. Summer, for this. Y'all have a good one. Thank y'all.